welcome to this edition of Peak Performance Podcast with your host, Thor Conklin. Thor will be sharing the necessary tools, strategies, and psychology you'll need to become a peak performer in any area of your life or business. Welcome back to another episode of the Peak Performers Podcast. I'm your host, Thor Conklin, and we have a very, very interesting gentleman with us today. Let me read his bio. Sit back. If you're driving, get uh, turn up the uh, radio a little bit. If you're watching this uh, on uh, YouTube, you actually are going to get a little sneak peek into what's going on because you can probably see behind him some of the things on the wall. John Coyle, he is the time guy. He is a world-leading expert in innovation and design thinking and the author of Design for Strengths, Applying Design Thinking to Individual and Team Strengths and The Art of Really Living Manifesto. He's a graduate of Stanford University's product design program. He's an NBC sports analyst, two-time TEDx presenter, author, sought-after keynote speaker, Oh, and by the way, he just happens to be an Olympic silver medalist for speed skating. John, welcome to the show. Man, we've got about 35 minutes. I don't know where we'd start. Any of these things, we could, you could uh, occupy at least a couple hours, man. How did you become obsessed with time? I mean, you got how many clocks there? Uh, at least a dozen of them behind you. I think there's 26, but I've sort of lost count. And I also stopped resetting them every daylight savings. It's just too much work. There you go. I got one clock behind me. That's, that's actually a t- countdown clock that I set every month uh, because the time as that clicks away, I realize that I don't have that time anymore, so use it preciously. So, man, I am, I'm all about this. I, I'm ready to learn from you. Go. Tell us, man. Well, so where did I get obsessed with time? So imagine this. Look at the 2002 Winter Games. It was a, a couple after mine, but... The difference between the gold medal and 10th place was 33 one hundredths of a second. Wow. So, you know, that's this long. 10 people in that space after a lifetime of training. So small increments of time really matter in sports, right? They really matter. Like gold medal and fourth place, you know, Seinfeld says like you know, first, second, third, never heard of you, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a big deal. And and this is where the translation happened is that's actually true in sort of regular life as well. Small increments of time, that decision you made or didn't, didn't make, that conversation you had or didn't have, the guy you approached or didn't, didn't approach, the, the girl you didn't approach or did approach, right? Like all of these little moments where big things happen are really my obsession. And, and, and the Greeks had this, by the way. The Greeks had this 2,000 years ago, we only have one word for time. It's the most common word in the English language, time. Uh, the Greeks had kairos and chronos. Chronos is what we think of in terms of time. It's clock time. But kairos is what I've been talking about. Uh, the etymology is actually when an archer releases. And so the etymology means when everything happens at once. And so those kairos moments that we have in life, they happen to us a lot, or not a lot, but they happen to us on some interval. But you can actually design them. And that's that's really my obsession is how do we create more of these Kairos moments where, where time stops, speeds up, and everything happens at once, and then big things happen. Tell us. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's a couple ways, uh, and, and, and I'll walk you through, I guess, a couple of the principles behind the upcoming book, which is going to be called Counterclockwise, Designing uh, Endless Summers. Uh, but one of the principles which most people get is, is the concept of uniqueness. Um, having unique experiences expands time. It creates these Kairos moments. But most people tend to do that in in terms of a breadth of experience, new things. And that's all fine and good. But what we miss is the way that eight-year-olds, who, by the way, had summers that lasted forever, right? Remember when summer lasted forever? Yeah. Right? So eight-year-olds have summers that last forever because not only they have new experiences, they have incredible depth of emotion attached to those. So the metaphor here is that time flows through your brain and my brain, much like I think uh, water flows through a garden hose, a fixed flow of water through a garden hose, is inver- the speed of it is inversely proportional to the aperture. So the more you shrink the aperture, the faster it goes. Same goes for time. So the aperture in this case is breadth of experience in terms of newness and depth of experience, emotional attachment. 
So when you're eight, everything's new and, you know, you have your first win, your first loss, your first crush, your first breakup, first time to the mountains, you know, first time getting pummeled by the ocean. You have these incredible highs and, you know, eight-year-olds cry a lot. So their breadth of experience is wide open. Their depth of experience is, is top down huge. And so time trickles through and summers last forever. But then we get into real life, right? And by middle age for a lot of people, well, they're breadth of experiences narrows and narrows and narrows everything's sort of the same commute same job same people same places on vacation and with the gauze of advil packs and air conditioning we don't have a lot of suffering so our suffering is is attenuated our highs are attenuated and now you've got this little aperture for time and now what a summer as an eight-year-old starts to feel like a decade in middle middle life and that that's the thing that i'm not cool with and the good news is that's all cognitive bias. There's 8,235,000 seconds in a summer, same as when we were eight. So if we, if we can have a cognitive bias in a clockwise fashion, which we currently experience generally, then how, how to unwind that, go counterclockwise, and design our lives for those endless summers again. So that's, that's really my passion. All right. So I want to make sure I got this right. So in order to slow down time, is to expand the experiences and then go deep emotionally into the experiences? Correct. Presence? Is that, am I being... Presence is is really essential. I mean, if you're emotionally engaged, frankly, then you will be present. So mindfulness is, is, is to me, is, is a path to get to that present. But the reality is, I mean, for most people, the birth of your son, the first I love you, the first breakup, you're going to be fully present. Like right. when your amygdala gets involved and starts laying down memory or helps laying down memory through the hippocampus, when the amygdala is involved, you are focused. It, it necessarily shunts your focus to the thing at hand. And, and that's the beauty of designing these intense moments is you don't actually have to be a mindfulness expert to experience some of these moments because you will naturally bring your attention to that which is compelling, important, and, and frankly, one of the sort of sidelines of this is risky. Risk brings out the kinds of memories that the amygdala gets involved in that then become those memories that have before and after and slow down time. Risk or fear? Uh, both, both. Uh, perceived risk, which has an element of fear. Sometimes, though, you can have a perceived risk and if you're in the flow state, you don't actually feel any fear. Yeah. You'll, still, you'll still lay down those memories that you can always recall later and thin slice and so forth. Maybe you can uh, uh, explain something to me because this is something that I've always had a talent for. When chaos occurs and, and the rest of the world is just kind of freaking out, I get very calm and I get very focused. If I was in a room uh, that started to catch on fire, I, I go completely calm and time seems to slow down for me. Yes. Um, I, I, I can see things, hear things, and, and people are almost moving in slow motion. Yes. But they're, they're going crazy. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a zone that is completely, I feel completely in control. Yeah. Um, and I, I seem like I can accomplish so much more. It's almost like a superhuman strength, uh, a, a sense or strength. Mm-hmm. How, is there a name for this or is it just me? It is not just you. I feel the exact same way, by the way. And there's a subset of the population that really does thrive on crisis. Yeah. Uh, I, I was at Goldman Sachs for an entire year working in Y2K, which, you know, there's nothing yeah. more mind numbing and boring and, and <laughs> risk averse, right? So the whole thing is about avoiding risk. And, and I was miserable until about six months in when all the systems shut down simultaneously. And then everybody else was running with their hair caught on fire. And like you, I was like, Oh, my zone. Yeah. What do I do? Where can I add yeah. the most value? Yeah. Uh, you could see everything. And, and, and by the way, the, the brain chemistry there is, is or it's not actually chemistry, it's electrokinetics. But when the amygdala gets involved, when there's risk, potential for fear, you're, normally you're taking in a frame rate of about a second and a half in terms of your short-term memory. So your hippocampus then shunts that to long-term memory every second and a half. It can hold up seven seconds, but generally speaking, in normal circumstances, about every second and a half. When that moment happens, when crisis happens, for you and I, and for, for a subset of the population, the amygdala gets involved. Instead of freaking out, it speeds up and it goes about every tenth of a second. So you're actually taking uh-huh. in about 15 times more data more quickly. So, so time feels 15 times slower. Okay. And so you can sort of see all the possibilities, sort of yeah. like the beautiful mind moment. Yeah. You see all this possibility emerging, and, and that's when you are at your best, and, and, and me too. And so can we cre- recreate this without like LSD or something? 
You, yes, you can, you can. And I think, I think there's uh, five elements that I've sort of attributed to getting into that mode. One of them is the flow state. You're probably familiar with that. Yep. Uh, so the flow state is just when you're sort of in your area of strengths. One of the things that's probably true for you and for me as well is, is we thrive under crisis. We, we, we can handle that kind of pressure. So, so we move into the flow state which means you're also taking in uh, more data, not just a faster frame rate, you can actually hold more data in those frames. So you're taking in more data faster. Uh, the others that I think it often have involved is, well, always emotional intensity, always. So that's where the amygdala gets involved in, in scripting memory and leaving it uh, in a place where you can always find it. Physical intensity is sometimes part of it. Uh, beauty, some form of beauty is also usually part of it. You, like. I don't know about you, but like when that crisis happened, I, I was so happy actually. Like I knew I had a shunt between a bunch of buildings in New York city and I was the fastest runner that on the team and we were like physically carrying documents. And so I like, I had, a, I had like this sense of beauty of like, I know the city, I know where to go and all that. And then the, the, the last one is, uh, is uniqueness, you know, something different out, out of the norm, not routine. And when you stack all five of those, beauty, physical intensity, emotional intensity, flow state, and uniqueness, uh, that's when you can sometimes have these moments where, where there's a before and after, where there's a notch in your mental sort of yardstick. Because, you know, the worst, the inverse of this is the worst to me. Is like, I don't rem like, I don't actually remember 2005. I don't. Like, nothing happened. Nothing of note. Yeah. Some people can say that about a decade. Right? But when you have those memories where all that happens and you have that incredible... And sometimes these moments last not very long at all. We're talking 2, 10, 5, 20 seconds. Uh, but they can be life-changing. They certainly have a before and after, and you always remember them. Because when the amygdala gets involved in leaving memory, it leaves a trail. You can always find that memory. We lose a lot of memories. They're yeah. stored. We don't actually ever really lose memories, absent disease. Uh, but we just can't usually find the ones that are not interesting or intense enough. You know, it's interesting because as an executive coach and profitability consultant, you know, a lot of times I see entrepreneurs uh, that people like to call it sabotaging. I don't think it's sabotaging, but people will create these uh, situations where they're actually now under immense pressure because that's where they feel like they, they thrive. Yes. You know, as I'm going through this, uh, writing down this list, I'm almost wondering if we're, and this is going to sound weird, and I'm just going to throw this out, and, and I want your uh, thought on this, is I wonder if we're not throwing enough into our activity. Because I, first of all, I think there's a ton of distractions, and we're throwing a bunch of garbage that we don't need to be dealing with. But right. I am wonder if we're not accelerating or putting enough into our box to create that sense of urgency, that sense of emotional intensity, that, that fear factor, that flow state. I'm wondering if the challenge in many times hasn't been a big enough one. Uh, example, I'm training for my first Ironman this year. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know you're a big cyclist, uh, obviously a uh, silver medalist in the Olympics as well. And I just picked something that was, was crazy. I've never run mm -hmm. a marathon. I, running <laughs> a lake for 112 miles, I'd never done you're going it. going big. Right, I just, right, just go big and I'll figure it out, right? Right. Um, and I'm, I'm finding that I can, I can actually do these things. I finished my first half M, uh, I am, and now I'm, uh, it's coming up. I got 12 weeks left, and I'm training my butt off, as you can imagine. I'll bet, yeah. But as, as, the, as the requirement on me and my, my muscles, and my abilities are, are, ten, are rising to meet the challenge. And I'm wondering right. in, our, in our lives, when people just kind of miss that whole decade, has the challenge not been there? Have they not been pushing themselves enough. What, what's your I, thoughts on this? I think that's ex exactly spot on. And, and the, me the metaphor, metaphor I make here is Maslow's. So Maslow's hierarchy, first you've got to get safety and security, right? So you leave college, say, or, or you, know, you leave your, your, your home when you're a kid and you get a job. And so you, you get safety and security for most people relatively swiftly, but not for everybody. And then you move up the ladder and you get love and belonging through having boyfriend, girlfriend, kids, wife, husband. And then esteem is the fourth level which is, you know, you work really hard in your job and, and eventually with expertise and focus and discipline, you, you get the esteem of the people around you. And this is where a lot of people stop because there's one more or two, depending on when you talk to Maslow, self-actualization. And for most people, I would argue that's not a step. It's a leap. 
is everything that got you to esteem, discipline, focus, uh, uh, narrow expertise, risk aversion, all of these things which are not bad things by themselves, they don't usually let you, let you get to the next level. And so for you, and for a lot of entrepreneurs, they don't have this problem. They are constantly leaping, right? Um, and this creates all kinds of havoc for the people under them that actually are not interested in leaping. You know, there's a very different sort of mentality by and large for entrepreneurs versus the people that work for them. But for the, those that are sort of in the workforce, which, you know, is a vast majority working for somebody else, you get to esteem, you get comfortable, you get safe. But you, for me, and I think for millions of others, it's sort of this almost like this sense of vertigo. You claw and climb and get there, work so hard, and then you stand in this little narrow precipice and you look around you and everything's a cliff because any change from the current routine means the potential for loss of, of esteem, loss of, of uh, your job, your income, all of these things you've built, and life becomes a wall of have-tos. And that's actually not a great place to be, but it's so safe that most people never depart, I think. Yeah. And never take on that big challenge, the thing you're talking about. Yeah. Interesting. Hey, I'm going to ask you to take your microphone and just raise it up just a little bit. Sure thing. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. We'll just jump, jump in the middle. So I know that you're putting together an event uh, coming up in Utah where you're going to spend a weekend. Uh, what's the name of that, that event, by the way? It's going to be called the Time Expansion Summit, Designing Endless Summers. I love it. So, so give us some of the framework of how we, what's going to happen at the event and what, what, what's the outcome? Why are people sure. going and then what, what are they going to get? So what's going to go into it is it's going to be a mix, mixture of some lecture, some neuroscience, some psychology, uh, not too much philosophy. I sort of steer clear of anything that's purely philosophical. I want to stick with, you know, what's the math? How does the brain work? How does it lay down memory? How does memory relate to our perception of time? Things like that. And then discussion, because those principles lead themselves very directly to what kind of actions or inactions you're currently taking. And from there, we're designing experiences that are going to be novel, uh, risky, physically intense, potentially emotionally intense, uh, full of beauty because we're up on a mountaintop. And I, I, I hesitate to share any of them without uh, ruining no, you, don't, you don't have to do that. Yeah. I'm just I'll, I'll, say, I'll say one thing that we are doing. Uh, I won't say what's involved. But you're familiar with the Tough Motor or the Spartan Race, yes? Yes. And those are, I don't know, they're like 10, 12 miles. We're yeah. doing the 0.1K Spart Mudder, all of the pain, none of the distance. <laughs> <laughs> so in 100 yards, you're going to experience a good deal of what it feels like to be in one of those races. And by the time you're done, I assure you, your amygdala will be involved with laying down this <laughs> I train with the Navy SEALs. Uh, oh, so then you know. Yeah. Well, I don't know what you have in store for him, but if it's only 100 yards, uh, <laughs> I, I will take it for, on face value that it will be painful. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I love that. Uh, and what, what are they going to get at the, at the end? Yeah. I mean, wh why would you go and what are you going to end up with? So I've been lucky, lucky in that I, you know, I speak, generally speaking, for a living, that's all I do. When I get a chance occasionally to do the content that's in this workshop, uh, what I hear over and over again is how it's a significantly fundamental shift in just how you perceive something that's floating all around you, this but time. We tend to accept that time is linear, and I will prove to everybody that comes to this that it's not, the way that we experience it is definitely not, and that it speeds up and it slows down, and that's related to brain function, and very specifically, you can manipulate your cognitive processes to slow stop and reverse the acceleration of time and have those summers that last forever. So people that walk out of there will know how to design their life to be so expansive that instead of living, say, 40 more years, it will feel like 400. And I'm about 15 years into this year. Uh, and, and the other sort of outcome there that, that I love that I don't hit directly, again, I don't really get into philosophy, I don't get into spirituality, but whenever I, do, whenever I get the chance to do this content, this happened just a couple weeks ago. A guy approaches me afterwards. He's waited in line for like an hour to talk to me. He's pretty emotional. And he says, listen, I was supposed to go to Florida this weekend for a business trip. I called the airline right after you were done talking. I canceled my flight. I called my wife. I said, pack up the car. We're going on a trip. And when I get home in an hour, we're getting in the car and we're driving to our kid's great grandparents' house three hours away. They've never met and they won't be around much longer. And we're going to spend the whole week with them. Because those are the experiences that matters. That work trip, he'll never remember. Right. 
But that chance to bring his kids to meet their great grandparents before they pass away, that, that matters. And so I don't get right into what, you know, what's meaningful or what matters, but people will figure it out by themselves because time is the most valuable currency we have. Yeah. No, no question. No question. Um, unlocking human potential. Uh, was this in one of your uh, first books? Yes, in the Design for Strengths book. All right, so give us some techniques on unlock, unlocking our human potential. So, you know, there's a big debate, and you're probably very cognizant of it, of that there's, there's, on the one camp, you've got Gladwell, who was quoting Anders Ericsson, the 10,000-hour rule is all that matters. You just got to put in the time, and, and you'll get the results. In fact, there was an article, I think yesterday, about this guy, I think his name was Dave, Dave McLaughlin, who decided to sort of take Anders Ericsson at his word, and he decided to try to become a pro golfer. And he put in, according to the article, 6,308 hours of, of diligent practice. And he did not make the PGA. On the other camp, you've got, uh, uh, you've got oh, uh, Buckingham and Roth and, and Gallup, that, you know, strengths finder and, you know, things like that, that strengths are what matters, you know, finding your, your natural talent. And, and I think both are asking the wrong question. What does it take to be a breakthrough performer? I think that's unilaterally factually true. It takes the equivalent of 10,000 hours. Nobody that's been great at anything from Bill Gates to Tiger Woods to, to Mozart didn't put in the time. But I think it's the wrong question to get back to design thinking, which is always like, what's the right question? What's the right question? The question is, why does anybody bother to suck it up for 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, which is not fun, is full of suffering, is fraught with risk of failure, and I think the reason for that has become very clear from relatively new science. It is because, I believe, of the flow state, and very specifically because flow state performers are addicted. If you get into the flow state, and this is out of uh, Kotler's Rise of Superman. I love that book. Uh, if you get in the flow state, you go through the following uh, chemical releases in your body. Uh, uh, first, it's uh, ephedrine, then dopamine, then serotonin, then andonamide, and then oxytocin. Now, if those were chemical equivalents from outside your body, that is meth, coke, heroin, pot, and ecstasy, all within a fairly short period, which would either kill you or leave you drooling. But instead, we, we, we pull these chemicals naturally out of our system to aid us in this approach to doing something really well with skill and finesse. And it leaves us with this incredible feeling of euphoria by, by the end and a sense of accomplishment. And... Michaeli, Cheek Send Me High, the guy who wrote the book flow, says, I'll misquote him slightly, but that all of mankind throughout all history has been in pursuit merely of this state. So peak performers get into the flow state. They get these chemicals. They want to do it more. That means why, that's why they're willing to do it. This is why you're willing to do what you do as well. Like you put in the time, not because it's easy, but because you get on occasion that operant conditioning, variable oper operant conditioning of the flow state. That's my hypothesis anyway. Interesting. You know, it's funny because I talk about, you know, people say, you know, I, I need some motivation. I'm like, why are you looking for motivation? <laughs> it's a really lousy state or a lousy drug to use. Right. And what you're really looking for is addiction. And they're like, right. addiction? What do you mean? I said, you want to move from motivation to inspiration, uh, to habit, to ritual, to, to addiction. Right. Once you're addicted, uh, so think about it. What if you were addicted to being the best human you possibly could? What if you were addicted to loving your spouse more today than yesterday? What if you were addicted to providing more for your clients today than, than ever before? Right. That, that, it's automatic, right? It's just like, that's just what I do. And then I said, there's one more state and that's identity. Mm -hmm. And that's when you just get to the point where it, you just do it because that's who you are. Who you are. Yeah. You know, you make a great metaphor here. You remember the legend of Sisyphus? No. Sisyphus was cursed by the gods to roll a boulder up a hill and then let it roll back down for all of eternity. The worst thing the gods could conceive of for that man. Uh, I, would, I would suggest to you that speed skating is worse. Okay, so you go to cold countries in winter to go to artificially refrigerated environments to turn only left on the same exact same track no matter where you are in the world and you do it for hours on end for decades. How is that better than boulder rolling? I don't think it is. Well, if it's counterclockwise, can't you turn time backwards? <laughs> right, right. That's, that's the double entendre for the book. But the, the, the reason is, is because 
of everything you said. We are addicted to it because it's competition. It produces a flow state. And when we're successful, there's all this rush of chemicals and emotions that make us want to do it again and again and again, even though, frankly, from a outsider end perspective, it's probably one of the worst things in the world you could do. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> the way you described it, it didn't sound too interesting right? you know, or addictive at that point. Right. Uh, let, let's talk about flow. Uh, yeah. For a second. What are some techniques in order to get into the flow state? Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a number of different things, but uh, one is I truly believe you should be, you should have some native talent in whatever that thing is. I would argue you, you can't or will almost never get into the flow state if you don't have some native talent. Because one of the things that Cheek Sant Mihai talks about is this sort of flow channel. And, and the flow channel is the a narrow path where your skills meet the challenge. So if you're overskilled for the challenge, you're bored and you're not, yeah. you're not going to focus. And if you're underskilled versus the challenge, you're going to be overwhelmed. You're not going to be able to yeah. focus. But when you have that narrow channel where your skills and your performance meet, then, then that's the first step. I think the, another great trigger is if there's risk. Mm. Risk, uh, and this is where entrepreneurs, I think, get addicted to, to taking risks and to trying new things and to taking the business left and right, which makes everybody else crazy. But, you know, they're, they're not risk averse. In fact, they, they're risk addicted, I would say, yeah. to try new stuff. And, and so risk, perf, uh, you know, peak performance state, and then having some novelty, all of these things can combine to allow you to get in that state. And by the way, one of the hallmarks of it, which is why I, I love flow so much, is time shuts off when you're in flow. Yeah. That's specifically, all your mental circuits that calculate time, they just stop doing it. So we'll say things like, oh, time sped up or, or time stopped or both. And they're all accurate because you're not measuring it. So it's hard to articulate what that is. You know, it's interesting because everybody's struggling nowadays with all the distractions, everything that's coming at us all the time, our phones and everything. And there's a lot of talk about how to avoid all those different distractions. And it's, it's always interesting when I'm, I'm talking to an intelligent uh, person on the other end of this uh, show, which most of them are. Um, Thoughts, you know, and content really uh, starts to flow. And I'm wondering if those that are allowing a lot of these distractions to kind of creep in, it's because the pipeline isn't full enough. I I'm, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we, if, you know, if our native talent, the, the risk in this flow state is really a, a channel that is bursting at the seams with so much going on that there's no time or energy able to allow those distractions to penetrate. You know, in the absence of something, something will fill its space. That's right. What's your thought? Well, I think you're dead on. I mean, I sometimes get into that mode too, where it's just like, it's just emails, phone calls, emails, phone calls, emails, phone calls, text, 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 phone call. Yeah. Like, and none of that is critical or a top priority, but I don't have one that day or a week. So, and the absence of some sort of critical deliverable or crisis I, I get spread thin. Yeah. But then I'll give you an example. So I've been trying to write a book for two years um, and I got like 5,000 words done. And then my business partner, kudos to her, she's like, you know what? I think you need pressure to actually do stuff. So it's December 8th. I want the book done by January 1st. And I was like, you realize that's three weeks. She's like, yeah, I think you can do it. And so suddenly I just shut everything off. All those other yeah. outside noise disappeared. And for eight, nine hours a day, I wrote and I finished the book in three weeks. It was done January 2nd. I was one day late. Yeah. Uh, and I loved it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a blast. Yeah. It's funny. My tri coach, uh, I signed up for my first IM in November and I'm like, I'm training this entire time. And I just finished my half. And I was like, I think I could do another one. She's like, you can't do two. I'm like, <laughs> Excuse me. She goes, you can't do two in 34 days. I said, I can't do two in 34 days. I, I met a guy, Iron Cowboy, that did 50 of them in 50 states in 50 days. Right. I mean, I'm not in good shape as he is, but I can do, you know, two in 34 days. She goes, you can't do it. I'm like, oh, I'm going to show you. Right, right. I'm already signed up. Done. That's I'm awesome. I'm not going to say that. She told you that you couldn't do it. You know, that's all male. Right. I what? I can't do it? I'll show you. <laughs> right. <laughs> um. I, I want to end up, uh, well, uh, and uh, I want to get uh, how the folks can get in touch with you as well, but I want to hear a story. Um, the gentleman that hooked us up said, you got to hear the story of how you made uh, the Olympics and how you won the silver. So give us a little bit of background on how that happened. Yeah, so I was not quite smart enough to pass Math 202 my sophomore year at Stanford. 
And uh, I realized, and, it, and I failed for all the right reasons, meaning it wasn't for lack of effort. It wasn't for lack of studying. It was literally, I just wasn't smart enough. And, oh, uh, I see that you got an MBA from Kellogg. Yeah. I just, yeah I'm not I'm accepted not, that one. I'm not good at theoretical math is what it turned all out. Right. Okay. All right. And so whenever you fail for the right reasons, right. Um, what it is actually is it's just a guardrail for life. I will not ever be good at theoretical math. I'll never be good at tennis. I have no hand-eye coordination. So any hand-eye sport. Like, so, so I switched to the closest adjacent, adjacent engineering major, which was product design. And two or three weeks later, I got a guy named David Kelly as my academic advisor, not the movie producer, but pretty famous in his own world. He founded IDEO, Stanford's D School, great designer, taught me design thinking. Fast forward, I'm a senior. Uh, I just won the U.S. trials, and I got 12th place in the world despite living in California with no coach and no training program. So I graduate, and I'm like, okay, going from 12th to 6th to 1st in the two years I have to prep for the games. This is where sort of design thinking intercedes. The coaches put me through some tests, gathered some data, and they said, Coyle, you know, we need to work on your aerobic weakness, so we're going to teach you how to go farther faster because I didn't have much endurance. Sounded good, good, smart people, great coaches. I did what they said, and I went from 12th to 34th, so not making the team two years later, finishing 30th in the trials that I'd won two years prior. So I, at that point, I was actually I was ready to quit because it was terrible. But I kept thinking back, you know, I didn't used to be terrible. Something's wrong here. I need to, I need to quit the team, not the sport. Yeah. So I quit the team, not the sport. Nobody wanted that to happen, by the way. Did, did your times get worse or did the competition get better? Oh, times got worse. I was it's actually slower than I had been 10 years prior. <laughs> got it. <laughs> Because that's what focusing on your weaknesses does for you. Because those are my weaknesses. I have no aerobic capacity. So, yeah. so I, I quit the team, not the sport, trained all by myself for a year, and I focused on my strengths and aerobic power. I changed my track, my technique, to skate a narrower, tighter track so that I wasn't going any faster, but I was going less far. So everybody else would skate wide and keep their speed up, and I would just slow down in the straightaways and then hit the, the corners hard, and i go about 10% less far. And so I showed up a year to the day of getting 30th at the U.S. Trials, 10 seconds off the pace. In my first race back, I broke the U.S. record by five and a half seconds and skated a second faster than the world record. Wow. Same me, same musculature, same everything. Just a better question, a better answer. And so that's where, you know, for me, design thinking is such a powerful tool. When you get super stuck, it's probably because you're solving the wrong problem. And you went to your strength. Right. Yeah. When you can double down on your strengths, good things happen. I mean, that's just it's been true every single time. And I, and I t I've been talking about this for 20 years and I still catch myself going to fix the stuff that's wrong. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. What, what do you think? Let's talk about business executives or, or entrepreneurs. Where do you think they get tripped up the most? Because one of the things that we do a lot of for, uh, for our clients is we identify the thing that's getting in the way. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it, might, it might be a weakness, but in many cases, we can just eliminate it. Right. Uh, sometimes it's, it's a strategy. Sometimes it's a psychology. Well, what do you find that gets in the way of most peak performers? Uh, most peak performers. Well, so... Or those that want to be peak performers. Yeah. Most high achievers I know are subject to something I call a collective adult neurosis. Uh, and that's probably you too. Uh, so if I'm calling you crazy, yes, I am. Uh, that's okay. I am too. Done. Uh, we are trained since kids, operant conditioning for, for a decade or two to never quit, right? Quitters never prosper. Good things come to those who wait. Uh, never quit, never give in. All of these great platitudes. And they're awesome for kids because kids, kids will quit anything too, too quickly. But at some point, I think those, that same advice goes off the rails for adults because sometimes it is absolutely the right thing to do. You know, but we're just unwilling to let go for a better grip. As uh, Scott Adams from Dilbert puts it, persistence is awesome until it's stupid. <laughs> and I think a lot of people, particularly entrepreneurs, are just not willing to let go of an idea because they're sort of in love with it or just not willing to quit. And they believe this sort of, this brainwashed mindset that if I just keep working at it, it'll eventually work. And right to the left or right of that idea is probably the thing they should be doing. Just like for me, you know, I, two years is a long time that I put into training that way. And the day I let go of, I'm not, I'm not an aerobic athlete, I never will be, was the day I could actually design for what I'm good at. Yeah. And great things followed in that wake. Yeah. I, I have a mentor that says, you know, everybody loves their own baby. And <laughs> right. some babies are ugly. That's right. Uh, and just because you love your product, you love your service. If your clients aren't paying for it, uh, it doesn't matter. 
That's right. That's gotta, right. Stop loving that uh, that baby. Tell me some of the uh, keynotes uh, topics that you uh, speak on. So uh, all my topics are sort of anchored to a design thinking reframe. So design thinking is always about: Are we asking the right question? Are we solving the wrong right problem? And so the, the three main keynotes I do reframe commonly common questions that people, particularly high achievers, ask and answer, and I think they are asking the wrong questions. So the first one, designed for strengths, is instead of how do I fix my weaknesses, a better question is how do I design my life, my career, my team, my enterprise for my strengths, for its strengths, and design around weaknesses rather than fix them. Right. Delegate, de delegate, defer, find an expert that can do it. Like, just don't make it be you, right? So that's the first one. And that's really, uh, the people that, you know, so here that keynote is like, oh my God, I, I can actually let go of some things. Like, which is really hard for high achievers, you know? Um, but when they can get reframed on the thing they're great at, so that makes it a little easier to, to let go of those things and grasp on uh, things that matter more. Second one, which you hear over and over again, I'm sure you've heard it on your podcast, is around like work-life balance and stress and, and, uh, and you know, uh, how do I reduce my stress to perform better? That's a commonly asked question. And I think it's the wrong yeah. question because there's no trend suggesting this is going to slow down, right? No. This, this train is just accelerating. Yep. So a better question is, how do I perform better under greater stress and learn to like it? Love it. Which is totally possible. This is what athletes, well, it's what you yeah, do every day, right? Absolutely. You are increasing your stress yeah. in order to perform better tomorrow. Yeah. But you recover. That's right? correct. That's correct. <laughs> that, that, you, right. You are not doing 15 hours of cycling, running, or swimming, and then doing it again, right? Right. right. <laughs> Uh, no, no plans. It might not be closer to 18 hours. But, right. but corporate athletes, that's what they do every day. They work yeah. nonstop with yeah. not proper recovery, and then they never – and the other thing is gamification. The triathlon for you is a game. It's, it's fun in many ways. It's going to be it, – it, and, and when you choose to view something as game, as competition, as, as, as a challenge to be solved versus yeah. a threat, like business threats, the competition – uh, one side, the, the gamification side, you get DHEA and, and uh, oxytocin, which causes you to broaden your perspective, so see opportunity that's not right in front of your face, and ask for help. Uh, the other threat uh, causes cortisol, narrowing a focus. I can only see the thing in front of me, and I hunker down and don't ask for help. Yep. So which is more important in the world, complex world of business? Almost unilaterally, you want to have DHEA and oxytocin because you can't solve all your own problems. It's too complicated these days. So that's the second talk. And then third, was my favorite, of course, is a reframe of Lincoln. But instead of more years in my life, how do I manipulate cognitive time to have more life in my years and live summers longer than I was a kid? I, I love it. That stress one's a big one with me. A matter of fact, we were talking before we started the show. That was actually the talk that I was giving. And, and I said, meditation's a really bad recipe uh, or a, a bad prescription to use for stress. Because what we're we take we got all this stress and it's like, let me just come. Let me just, come. Let me just meditate it down. We didn't do anything with it. We didn't, we didn't fix anything. We didn't do anything. It's like the, uh, my belief is if, if you, one, use the stress. I absolutely love that. Use it. Right. Take action. You want to eliminate the stress? Take some action. Move. I don't even care if you're not even moving in the right direction. Right. Movement will take care of a lot of it. But please yeah. just don't settle it down. It, it's kind of like, you know, we use alcohol. We use drugs. We use right. all this stuff. And it's like we're always attacking the symptoms and right. never the problem. Well, That's right. You know, love that. Man, we could go on and on and on. <laughs> This is awesome uh, stuff. Tell them how they can get some information about the event over in Utah and, and also for all those uh, corporate execs, execs listening today, how they can get you in to do a keynote. Yeah, so easy to find me. Uh, JohnKCoyle.com is my website. All my videos are up there. I've done two TEDx talks, Chicago Ideas Week. So you can see the topics up there. And uh, coming soon will be, and also the book, Design yes, for Strength. That's, right. yeah. that's uh, on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. You can look for my name or you can look for the book title, Design for Strengths. You know, the book's really about how do you design your life, your team, your enterprise for the strengths that you have and design around those weaknesses and it's illuminated with stories because frankly you know people don't really care just to hear about principles and facts and frameworks right there's, there's a lot of fun stories there and then this uh the the, the time expansion summit in eden utah it's going to be held at summit uh is uh, september 14 to 16 and it's it's going to be 
uh, an application based event because it's pretty limited uh, seating. But you know, we're gonna we're gonna gather, we're gonna curate a group of executives, athletes, artists, musicians, and we're gonna create experiences that I hope and I believe will leave. Uh, the vast majority of the participants changed forever in terms of how they perceive time. And very simply, I can still my whole life in terms of my thinking all down to one sentence. And I'll, I'll say it twice just so you can sort of ponder it for a second. The value of an increment of time is not related to its duration. So we tend to view each second as worth the same as the last. Each hour is the same each week, each month. But when you can recognize that there are moments, these Kairos moments that matter far more than the weeks or months or even years preceding them, and design more of those and stack the kind of, of experiences that, that it requires in terms of beauty, physical intensity, emotional intensity, flow, and uniqueness. When you can do that, you won't live 40 more years, live 400. So I hope to give all participants the one greatest gift I think I can give, which is the gift of time. I absolutely love that. John, this has been an absolute pr pleasure. I'm losing my voice. I'm losing my time. <laughs> I'm losing everything today. I really appreciate uh, you coming on, and uh, I look forward to having you back on when the, uh, the book goes live. Awesome. Yeah, great to meet you, Thor. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Okay, next time.